done inverse functions before. What did you remember about a function and its inverse? What kind of things can you tell me? Do you remember? Yeah, if you're looking at the graph, the x and the y are switched, which is caused by reflecting the graph over the line y equals x. So the graph of the function and its inverse are reflections of each other over the line y equals x. What else do you remember? Not exactly multiplying. When you compose them together, do they equal one? Not exactly. They equal? No. When you compose one way and compose the other way, you get the same thing. But the same thing that you get out is? It's x. Multiplicative inverses, when you multiply them together, you get one. But these aren't that kind of inverses. You get out x if you compose them. We did at least one example of that. Not everybody remembers that, obviously. What else do you remember about inverse functions? Remember our domain questions? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Question number four. Did this come from finding an inverse? Why? Did I care? What can you tell me about the domain of the inverse function? It's the same as the range of the original. And the domain of the original function is the same as the range of the inverse function. Okay? All those things are going to be kind of important. But there was one thing about inverse functions that you didn't mention. So we're going to evaluate inverse trig functions at different values. We're going to determine domain and range of inverse trig functions. We're going to use right angles. This is right triangles to do inverse trig functions. They're very easy on right triangles. And solve simple trigonometric equations requiring inverse trig functions. The names of the inverse trig functions, the official names. The inverse sine function is called the arc sine. The inverse cosine function is called the arc cosine. The inverse tangent is the arc tangent. And the inverse secant is the arc secant. Notice we don't mention the others because for the most part we never touch them. And we're really only going to hit these three in this class. In web work, you can write the, the arc sine of something as just like you wrote the sign ARC, SIN of, and then put it in, and it will give you out an answer. Another way you see these written is the following. Remember what we had on our function names for inverse functions when we did F inverse and G inverse? How did we indicate we had the inverse function? That little negative one and what appeared to be the exponential point sine inverse can be written this way as well. And web work will accept this as well. So you could actually write sine negative 1 of x or whatever it is, and it will say that's the same. It recognizes this and that as both inverse sine. Here is the graph of my sine function. Now I'm telling you that we're going to talk about the inverse sine function. What does it take for an original function to have an inverse? How did you test it? The vertical line test was the other one, was testing to see if it was a function. It was which one? I thought Katie said it. It's the horizontal line test. Does my sine function pass the horizontal line test? No. Then how can we talk about the inverse? You may recall you had one homework problem. And we did one example, I think. But you definitely had one homework problem. Where we said, OK, we have this nice graph. It doesn't pass the one-to-one -one test, doesn't do the horizontal line test. But we're going to lock part of it off. And we're going to use the rest of it and talk about finding the inverse of the rest of it. Well. In this case, I can't just lop off half the graph because the other half of the graph still would not meet my horizontal line test. So the standard thing that we do is we lop off two pieces of the graph and are left with just this teeny tiny little sliver of graph. Now, which little sliver do we want? Well, you could take any little sliver along the way, but the standard sliver has as much positive x-axis as possible and contains the point x equals 0. So if I'm going
going to do that, which sliver seems like the one I should take? The middle one? This one? Yep. I can't go any further this way because then I go back down, so that's not good. So I can only go to here. To get the zero in, I have to be able to include this side, and so I would go to here. That means for finding my sine graph, I am going to restrict myself. So I'm going to restrict the sine. to go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and I'm including both of those pieces. So this is the restricted domain. Now, for this restricted graph, what is the range? Where does it, what do my y values go from and to? And are they included or not? Included. included. So my range on my restricted graph goes from negative 1 to 1. And that's good because that's everything that I hit with my sine function, right? And that's what I wanted. I wanted all the possible output values I could get. But I needed to restrict my domain so that I don't have any of them twice. So now I'm going to show you what this graph looks like when I reflect it over the line y equals x. It looks like this. This is what my sine inverse graph looks like. Cool. So for my sine inverse of x, what is the domain? One to one. Negative one to one. Negative one to one. Remember, it's the range of my original graph. What is the range? Negative pi over two to pi over two. Negative pi over two to pi over two. The range. Oh, sorry. The range of my inverse was the restricted domain of my original sine function. Now I have a question. My output values for my sine inverse function have to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. In terms of my unit circle, we're pretending this is such. Where is this range? Where are my angles going to come out? What quadrants? Where's negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 in my unit circle? 2.4. Right here, quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. <coughs> now, Notice the following though. In quadrant one, I'm headed in the positive direction to get my angles. In quadrant four, I have to get my angles from going in the negative direction. And that's going to make a difference because if you have an angle that's in quadrant two that you take the sine of, and then you're asked for the sine inverse of it, you're not going to get the angle back out in quadrant two because the only places I can get angles out are in quadrant one and four. And so we're going to talk about how we figure that out. If we start out in quadrant two, take the sine, and then the sine inverse, then what happens? And we'll, we'll get it there. We can do it. But now let's look at our cosine function. Uh, we already did the domain range. Here's my cosine function. Now, again, we talked about.